11 seconds remaining. One last rush, perhaps, for the Flyers. Giroux to Hartnell. To Giroux. Giroux holds, holds, all the way across. Parker scores! 2.1 seconds remaining, and the Flyers are on top! It's Isaiah from the OMB Podcast, brought to you by phillysportsnetwork.com and Wildfire Radio. Back with episode 51 as the Flyers have made a flurry of moves. Chuck Fletcher's a busy man before, during, and after the draft. And stay put, because we got you covered. I'm here with my partners. Uh, Chef B, how are you, man? Good. Waiting for some post-draft talk, some post-move talk, any kind of talk. Something that's being done at least, and I'm happy. Good, good. And uh, from National Pod, National Puck, Brotherly Pod, Brotherly Puck, Dan the Flyer fan. How are you, man? I'm doing good. It's a nice day. Flyers are making moves. What more could you ask for? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're right about that. The Flyers have definitely made moves. And, you know, there's so much ground to cover. And we're going to have Russ Cohen on from Sportsology.com and multiple other outlets and podcasts. And we're going to cover the draft for you comprehensively like no nowhere else so like i said stay put he'll be along in about 20 minutes or so but we got to catch up uh jen since we last got together the blues win the stanley cup and the official o and b podcast uh forecast a prediction there came true blues and seven so that definitely was good and uh, dan i just wanted to hit you up with one thing you know there's a certain level of fan that was talking about baruby and shen as, oh wow, more Flyers that won a cup that were used to be with the Flyers. But I think a lot of other fans felt like, you know what? Ryan O'Reilly could have been a Flyer. And I think we talked about this on our last show. That is, if you're going to lament anything, it's that. That, you know, Hextall didn't get a guy like that and how good he would fit in this lineup. That I mean, that if, if I'm worried about that kind of stuff at all, that's where I'd be going. Yeah, you know, Baruby wasn't anything special here. Obviously, the team that he inherited was designed for Peter Laviolette, so you really can't blame much him. He wanted to do a different system, and Braden Shen was never the picture of consistency here. You know, he had some good games and he had some bad games, but never really enough to where I was, you know, overwhelmingly impressed by the guy. But, uh, yeah, O'Reilly is the guy that Hextall should have brought in last summer, and because he didn't want to trade any draft picks or prospects, he didn't. And, uh, you know, Blues won the Cup, and the Flyers didn't even make the playoffs, so they paid for that move. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's some, a lot of opportunities. You could say Ryan O'Reilly, or even putting that third year for Paul Stasny, as was rumored by Anthony Sanfilippo, because uh, JBR is actually the second choice for the Flyers. But listen, that's history. Congratulations to the Blues. And uh, we got to move on what the Flyers did. First move, they trade Radko Gudashev for Matt Niskanen. And even though the Capitals were kind of a cap strap team, the Flyers wanted Niskanen so bad, they retained a little over a million dollars in salary to make this happen. Well, Niskanen is going to cost the Flyers 6.8 roughly on the cap with the retention and 5.75 going forward. Uh, what was your impression of the deal and how it's going to help the team? No, of course, I didn't. I didn't like the fact that they uh, they got stuck with, you know, picking up some of the salary. But on the other hand, uh, I thought it was ironic that all the people uh, you would have thought that yeah you know, we traded Giroux the way Flyers Twitter blew up like how can we get rid of him he was our most consistent defenseman and where were you guys all season when you, you were all they did was bash him I actually really liked the move I think it's I, I think and you were very specific about it I'll say this of, of the Flyers troubles last year they couldn't get out of their zone. And they haven't had a guy that can really get them that, that first pass and, and get that play started up the ice in a long time. And I think 
I think Niskanen is better than that than Gudis ever will be. And even though you're getting him on his later years, I think he's somebody that the young defenseman can learn from and maybe like settle down. Like well, it seems like the Flyers' defense was all jumpy, and they want more stay-at-home kind of guys. It looks like by the rest of the signings to help Carter Hart out, so it's not a shooting gallery on him. Yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. I think Niskanen is a higher level defenseman, and we'll just have to see how that works out. I think the Flyers uh, are there's a, a little bit of um, wishful thinking for the Flyers. Uh, Niskanen really went back last year. His uh, uh, possession numbers are I, look. I'm not a one factor analysis fan, but th- when something is is really bad, it looks like someone cratered. Uh, that would be a good explanation for Niskanen's performance. However, he did go on a Stanley Cup drive, and that did seem to take a lot out of him. Hopefully, you know, the Flyers uh, are, are hoping, of course, that he can rebound. But moving along, uh, Dan, so the Flyers buy out Andrew McDonald, uh, $1.3 million this year, $1.9 million next year on the cap. That was overdue. Let's get you to comment on that and the fact that they traded for Justin Braun, a second and a third, second time they're dealing with a cap strap team and seem to overpay or, or not just get top value. In fact, Jay Greenberg went on satellite radio and called the move puzzling. So, yeah, AMAC and Justin Braun. Uh, you know, they bought out Andrew McDonald, and, and I was, if it was up to me, I wouldn't have done that. I would have just bit the bullet and, and you know, let him out on his last year so you didn't have to pay him anything next year because obviously it's $1.9 million. But obviously Fletcher had a plan at the time, and he's done a couple moves after that too, you know, at least back up the fact that he did it so he did need the cap space so it's fine as for braun you know they vastly overpaid as far as i'm concerned especially when you see you know what guys like Truber are going for you know so they paid a trade deadline price maybe even more than a trade deadline price for a guy but you know listen they obviously wanted a culture change in the room uh they wanted a i even hate to say the word anymore but veteran presence you know they didn't want uh, an andrew mcdonald and uh, brandon manning they wanted guys that could you know still at least somewhat play the game you know if braun had a longer deal i'd be much more angry about it but it's only one year you know it's not like they're committed long term so it, it, it was an overpayment but at the end of the day it shouldn't be uh shouldn't cause too much havoc down the road yeah i yeah these are short-term commitments and with both niskin and especially braun a one-year commitment but uh when uh, kevin hayes is signed chef 7.14 million that's 50 million for seven years to me, that sounds like at least a half a million, more like three quarters of a million dollars in an overpayment for a pretty solid player. But if you add all this up, uh, the Flyers are get a nice player and they're kind of hoping two guys can rebound because Braun has been going back for a couple of years. And with Niskin in, they're, they're kind of hoping these guys maybe can play above where they've been the last couple of years. First, if you, Chef, give me the your your impressions about Hayes and then like take these three moves and kind of sum up where you think the Flyers are at right now before we move on. Okay. <clears throat> no problem. Uh, for Hayes, I liked it. I thought it was one, you know, of course the term was always going to get me. It's, you know, always too long. I, I, I think for that, uh, the money was, uh, unfortunately the money was right where I thought it was going to be. I think I said 7.5, I mean, 6.75 to 7.25, I, that's where I thought he was going to end up. Yeah. That's what the market drove, you know? It's a shame that, you know, that that's the kind of money that you would expect to give Duchesne, you know? And, you know, but that being said, I like the fact that they made these moves. It shows that they're not just sitting on their their laurels waiting for something to happen, you know? They, they needed something to happen. And for Braun, you know, uh, Niskanen, I think he comes back and has a, a rebound year. Braun, Braun's a little trickier. Uh, Braun had like rotating defensive partners last year, like December on. Like Velasic, I think kept getting hurt. I think he was with, with Brendan Dillon a little bit. Right. I don't think he ever caught his stride. Right. So uh, I'm just thinking that if he can just have a steady partner and somebody that can work on his, you know, like he can get back his game, and, and it's for one year. So it really doesn't bother me. I think they're good moves. They're win-now moves, or we're going to get better right away moves, as opposed to 
not getting a goalie last year, not making a move last year, because God forbid we give up a prospect. Yeah, no, no, I, I can see that. Dan, let's um, let's break down the Hayes contract just a little bit for the listeners' understanding in terms of no move, no trade, and what the impact and implications are for the expansion draft and what people's expectations are with regard to how movable this player will be in the less desirable years. Well, he's got a three-year no-movement clause, which means that he will be, the Flyers will be forced to protect him during the uh, expansion draft. So they are a force to eat this contract. You know, I saw when the contract was first signed, I saw people on Twitter go, oh, well, you know, if this backfires, just give him to Seattle. And then the no-movement came out. And uh, he he is on board now one way or the other here. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I've ranted about this for two weeks on my shows now, so I'm not going to go off here. But, um, you know, it, it, it's not my favorite deal. I think short term it's going to help. I think in three, four years from now, it's going to be a disaster. But, uh, you know, if they wanted to make the team better this year, they certainly did. But uh, I don't know how this is going to look uh, down the road. Yeah, the only thing is, and I think we we talked about this uh, on your show over the weekend, I mean, the the Flyers aren't going to invest seven years in a guy who, in two years, they're going to be ready to give him up for expansion. So that's kind of silly. I'm not really worried about the three years. And there's 12 teams that he won't get traded to out of the 32 that will be there coming up after the third year. So... It's not as prohibitive as some people have made it out to be. But, yep, Dan, let me get right back to you. Looking, though, there's a couple things that resonate with me. Number one, Chuck Fletcher felt compelled to set the table and have all of his ducks in order, or in a row, if you will, before the draft. So seemingly something would happen. Secondly, I, I sit back... And I look at, well, Truma goes to New York, and Truma was only going to go to, to two teams, according to league executives. His uh, fiance is going to medical school. Maybe she wanted to go to Columbia Presbyterian, what have you. There's a family issue. He, he didn't want to play in Canada, according to Peter Tessier from HockeyBuzz.com. Okay, fine. Well, there's nothing the Flyers could do about that. But big picture, like... The Flyers are now kind of hurting for cap space. We'll talk about some of the other trades and signings and moves. But, like, wh- where's the wow? Like, wh- like, where's the the Flyers are running out of time because everything's predicated upon capturing the opportunity afforded by Giroux and Voracek still in their primes. And, like, we have Hayes, Braun, and Niskanen, and a lot of hope that a young kids are going to do something I don't know. Is that what we bargained for? Well, we talked about this on Coast to Coast, and I ranted about it last night on Brotherly Pod as well. I, this year, this team is going to be better. You know, there's not a question in my mind this coming season they're going to be better than they were last in the season before. But I don't see the bigger picture here. This feels like a bunch of moves that Fletcher made just to make moves. It feels like the dying days of Paul Holmgren. You know, there was a time there where Paul Holmgren did make good moves, and then towards the end there he was just bringing in guys – like Andrew McDonald and throwing at massive contracts. And then they got, you know, booted for Ron Hextall. So it, it very much is a feel like that. You know, I, I just, I don't see the vision anymore. You know, Ron Hextall had a plan. He wanted the kids and, you know, it, he took far too long to do it, but at least he had a vision. Fletcher comes in and he settles for Hayes, Niskanen and Braun. And, you know, I, I don't think it's the end of the world, but, you know, you spent five years getting out of this salary cap trouble and in three weeks they're back in it and you know i just with all these kids that are coming up over the next three four years that need to be signed that are all going to get fairly decent deals and you're throwing you know over seven million dollars at kevin hayes of all people i just i thought they should have went a little bigger this year maybe aimed a little higher you know found somebody like a suban or a truba or a panarin or something and and that just doesn't seem to be the way they want to go i just i'm underwhelmed overall by what they've done so far yeah, especially, you know, on the pro side, definitely. We'll get into the draft with Russ, but, you know, you take a, a more global view, Chef, and I, I think Dan's got a point here. I mean, look, Eric Carlson signs an insane deal with San Jose. I, obviously, Doug Wilson is going to put that a backpack explosive on. 
and, and after three years, we don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where, I don't know when that timer is set for, but uh, he's, he's going for it. Okay, fine. Carlson's not available. I explained the Truba situation. He would have been really good here. But that parks me right into P.K. Subban. Yes, he's fading, but a couple things. He had a back problem last year. The year prior to that, he was saddled with Alexa Yemelin that kind of brought down his numbers. P.K. PK Subban is a guy who can take a lot of air up in the room. We talked about that. But he's not a bad guy or anything like that. But he's exactly, I mean, the only air P.K. Subban would have taken up in the Flyers' room is the stale air of losing and mediocrity for five to seven years that we've seen from the Flyers. And that's the kind of wow this fan base needed. You imagine an alternate scenario, Chef. Instead of jumping out there and getting Kevin Hayes, they wait. You get the Niskanen deal, fine. Now, I'm not saying this could have happened. They trade for Subban. They put Robert Haig in with uh, Igor Zamula and two second-round draft picks instead of trading for Justin Braun. And then instead of, like I said, with Hayes, then maybe Gostas Bear can be traded for Kadri. And now you have Kadri and P.K. Subban. Kadri's got two 30-goal seasons. So, okay, Kadri's not the two-way player that Hayes is. So you go out and get like a you know, a great two-way player who can kill penalties like Eunice uh, uh, Donskoy from San Jose, I I think that's a better plan. I don't know if it's possible, but I kind of think that's where the Flyers fans were kind of oriented toward when they were were spending money and now they're up against the cap. What what say you? Yeah, I think it would have been a sexy move. I think it would have been definitely uh, something... That you everything that you really alluded to. My only thing is this: I don't know. I don't. I'm. I'm a jury still out on Subban for me. I just think he's not half as good as anymore. As I, I, I think he. You know, people think he is. I think he might be a bust this year. I, I hate the fact. I, I didn't want. I don't want to give up on the guy. I don't like to give up on players, but I'm kind of sort of am. But also at the same time, why the hell did he have to go to New Jersey, though? He had to go to a division rival, you know? So, uh, all in all, I think they're all great moves. I don't know how realistic they would have been. Uh, like, like, Dan's talking about long term, you know, and, and money and all that. You know, I, I just think that, that you would be in the same situation, if not worse, cap space with all that being handled. Well, I mean, you think about it. If Braun is not here and Gostas Bear is traded, and you can justify that, you have three years of uh, well, PK Subban. Million there, yeah, nine million. Yeah, it's yeah, only three years. I can see it. Yeah. And what you call a trade for Kadri is basically neutral. So the seven Hayes, seven million dollars from Kevin Hayes is not even a factor. Yeah. So, I'm just not. I guess I'm just not as big as a fan as Subban of PK Subban as I as as a lot of other people I just don't see it and I and to be honest too with the with the the coaching staff I don't know if it would it would have been a good decision or it could have been toxic well it could be I've never let an assistant coach uh prevent me from getting a, a better player than what I got uh, Dan what what's your feeling about the scenario that I painted I, I think you're absolutely right, and that's something I've thought about a lot myself. You know, I, I just feel like they didn't shoot high enough. You know, they they got the consolation prizes without ever taking a shot at the big dog. You know, they, you know, if they Niskanen and Braun, their contracts together would have been what you paid for Subban. You know, it's granted Subban had one more year, but it would have been fine. But Kadri would have been, you know, more or less, maybe, probably pretty close to what Kevin Hayes is going to provide, and he would have been a lot cheaper on a lot shorter term. I just. I, I don't know. I've been mulling this over for a couple days now, and I just, like, I'm glad he's making moves, and I'm glad he wants to compete. I'm just not thrilled with how he's doing it. I just feel like he just, he didn't shoot high enough for my liking. Yeah, I mean, for a guy who's methodical, I would think, you know, when Fletcher came in, you know the Flyers brass was there. Do this, do that, do this, do that. And Fletcher had enough control be you know just to the contrary of what we see in a lot of crazy flyers Twitter they're practically incontinent right now uh, but 
and, and I don't blame him for being upset about some things. Some people are just all negative all the time on everything. I mean, Hayes is a better player than Kadri on the other side of the puck. Let's not kid ourselves. So there, there's, there is a benefit to Hayes in that regard. But uh, I don't want to lose my train of thought here. But it, it, if he had all this time to calm down the Flyers' brass and be methodical like Charlie O'Connor has said, I think it's, it's an apt uh, description of him. This is what he came up with? It, it's like, like Dan is saying, it's like, wait a minute. Is this a team that's going to capture the moment of the, the latter prime years of G and Jake? Hayes is a nice player, overpaid by three quarters of a million, and Niskanen and Braun, and then they're going after a couple of years, and we hope and pray that one of Provorov, Myers, or Sandheim, or hopefully maybe two out of three, or, or, but like, you know what I mean? The timeline doesn't work yeah. for me. And I think the other thing is we move on, Chef. I mean, one of the most important positions on this team this year, if you listen to repeated interviews with Chuck Fletcher, is that backup goaltender. Mm -hmm. Has Chuck Fletcher's profligate ways led them to have to go back to Elliott or Tabbitt or somebody cheap? I heard today that the, the, actually the Calgary Flames are their favorite for Talbot. I don't know. I mean, that changes on a dime this time of year. But, I mean, I, I would have... Really, I want them to go out and get a really good backup plan for this 20-year-old, soon-to-be 21-year-old goalie who Chuck Fletcher has repeatedly expressed concern about putting too much pressure on. Yeah, and you and you haven't heard anything. I mean, I haven't heard anything, any chatter about going out getting a goalie. I thought, I thought it would have been possible that they would be, make some trade for a goalie. That Ghost would be part of that. If that's if that's a possibility, at least get somebody that's sturdy and dependable for Ghost. You know, Ghost's salary. I I don't know. I mean, I, I'm very concerned about this. I don't want to go into another season with, you know, basically, what I guess. I, what do you do? Last last ditch effort. You give Elliot a year deal. I mean, again, no, now you're no. worried about that. That's what I mean. That's it's horrible. It's a horrible. They they painted themselves into a little bit of a corner here. Because they, they they haven't even addressed it yet, as far as I can see. No, I got, Dan, what do you got? Like eighteen point nine million dollars left to pay uh, Provorov. They paid Sandheim. Uh, we'll catch you up on that. They paid him uh, what two years at what uh, six point five. Yep. Right, and then they have to pay Konechny and Lawton. They're not going to qualify Bailey. Shocker there, right? And uh, the other. The other move they made is they traded <laughs> soon to be UFA Ryan Hartman for Tyler Pitlick. And it, was, it looked, looked strictly to be a money move. Dallas didn't even qualify Ryan Hartman because the qualifying offer was uh, higher than their liking. So he, all of a sudden, Ryan ha uh, Hartman apparently is on vacation, doesn't even realize it. Hey, pal, you're a UFA. You went away, I'm a UFA. But I, I threw a lot at you there. What uh, Sort through that for us. <laughs> yeah, poor Ryan Hartman, huh? He goes away for a week out in the middle of nowhere, and, you know, he's traded and then unrestricted free agent because his qualifying offer is too high. And, you know, that's pretty much why I expected, uh, why I assumed that he was traded in the first place was the Flyers, is that, you know, his number just was not going to fit in the cap, and they'd rather get something than nothing for the guy. Um, and Pitlick is, is, is a fella. I still don't know a whole lot about him. But, hey, it's a one-year, $1 million contract. What more can you want from that, especially with this cap strap? But, you know, the goalie situation is going to be a little rough. Uh, you know, the free agent market, ironically, the two best goaltenders, not named but Rob's give Arlem up on the free agent mark and are probably uh, Cam Talbot and uh, Brian Elliott. So I don't know what they're going to do there. You know, you got Mike Smith, Cam Ward, uh, Chad Johnson, Peter Mrazek. Uh, you know, Varlamov. a lot of these guys are. Yeah, Var uh, Varlamov is there, probably going to get paid, I would assume. But yeah, Leonard. I mean, these are just. <laughs> yeah, Leonard. I've heard that he wants to stick with the Islanders, but it, there's just not a lot of options there. And, you know, without pay, and if you're going to pay Varlamov, then you're not going to have money for anybody else. You know, I, at this point, you're either going to have to, re, you know, be resigned to bringing in somebody less than stellar, or you're going to have to go out and, you know, weasel a trade somehow and bring in somebody different. But, uh, I don't know who that would be at this point. I'm kind of stumped with the goaltender situation. And, uh, Justin Bailey is, uh, not here. 
mildly surprised by that, I guess. But, uh, you know, he got called up and sent down about 35 times in two weeks this season. And uh, <laughs> every time he played, I just didn't really see anything special from the guy. He, he looked okay with the Phantoms, but, you know, when he came up, he just didn't seem to be anything special with the Flyers. So I'm not super surprised on that one. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's uh, an issue with the goaltending. I'd, I'd be willing to spend the money for Jake Allen. Uh, I really believe the Flyers want to make a big play this year. They can't lay that all on um, uh, Carter Hart. I've talked in the past about how even Carey Price, after a successful first year, the second and third years were went sideways. And thank God for the Canadians at that point, they had Yaro Halak, who turned into a really good trade asset later. But uh, I'm concerned about that. And yeah. you get a guy with a two-year deal like Allen. Yeah, it's expensive. Maybe St. Louis will hold hold the money, but I don't even think that's an option now. We'll, we'll have to find out. I guess the final question before uh, we get Russ on is, what, what you know, Chef, I don't see how they could trade Gostas Bear now because they, they no. lack a certain dynamic element with all these kind of middling to okay improvements they've made. And I just don't think Niskin in is the kind of guy who can step in for Ghost. And it's not like their power play was that much, uh, was really happening last year. I think right now it would make more sense to keep him. It might. I mean, like, everything was pointing to him going, but and then it doesn't anymore. It's it's funny how things work out. I I mean, I, I think that he probably made the power play a little bit better, but maybe not so much last year. I mean, the power play did get a little bit better by the end of the year. I mean, after the coaches changed and all that, but I'm still, I mean, like you got all the guys, if you look and nothing against Sam, big Sam, there's a lot of uh, stay at home, clear to porch kind of guys now. And, And do we have from sportsology.com and SiriusXM, NHL Radio, and many other podcasts with us, uh, Russ Cohen? Hello. Russ. Yep. Yep. Welcome to the OMB podcast, or welcome back, I should say. Wow, you've been a busy man these days, huh? Yeah, I have. I've been here, there, and everywhere, man. I bet you have. You went you went to the NHL draft, and uh, we'd like to cover that draft from, a, I guess, a league-wide perspective and then kind of drill down on the, the Flyers, um, okay. you know, and their picks and things like that. Um, so you're in Vancouver, and everything's going according to form, except there's not a lot of trades. And then all of a sudden, Chicago, with a mild surprise— with uh, Kirby Dak, what, what was your thought when he went instead of somebody like Byram or Turcotte? Yeah, I I really thought they'd go with Turcotte. Seemed like they had a great interview and they liked the kid. Um, it looks like when they probably were debating at the table, that size won out. Like, they probably felt like everything else is the same, so if everything's the same, we're going to go with size. I disagree with that, but it's not a bad pick. It's just not the pick I would have made. Yeah, is he a Mark Shifley kind of player, or is that more Alex Turcotte is more that kind of player? I, I guess it'd probably be Doc more than Turcotte. Um, Turcotte's a little different. Turcotte plays a real good 200-foot game, and and that's more than Doc does, and Turcotte, I think, is a little tougher than Doc. Doc has to put on some weight, and then maybe we'll see some more toughness out of him, but you know, I, I never use player comparisons. It's just not me, but but I would say Doc is closer. Gotcha, gotcha. Now I can appreciate that. Uh, I, I have this nasty habit of comparing the players. I get, I get people get on me all the time about it. But um, well, the draft definitely took uh, a different turn when Moritz Sider was picked by the uh, Detroit Red Wings. That you thought he was going going to go in the top ten. That wasn't a shock to you. No, it wasn't. And I, I just, you know, we did a we do a. Um, a pre-draft show, we were on the draft floor with Sirius XM. We brought up Cider, and, and both Shane Malloy and myself thought he'd be top 10. Like, I, I I, had him ranked about 12, I think, and but I felt like he was going to go top 10 in the draft for a long time. Definitely didn't hide that, and yet people still seem shocked. I, I, 
I've, I've even said for the last couple of weeks that I felt like he was the only one that could play in the NHL this year from the defense group. But and, and I think Detroit needs that, so I think that was extra, you know, enticement to to get him. Oh yeah, he's got he's got, he's got the body, he's got the puck skills. The only question about him is how much offense he's going to be able to bring, and he, that's really only the first couple of years. He, he really, he just flew up the boards, and uh, he's a great story, and he looks like a great kid. Did you have a chance to talk to him? Yeah, yeah, yeah a couple times, and, and he really is a, a nice kid, a fun guy, smart, mature. Uh, the interesting thing is, the only reason you didn't see a ton of offense was because when he started with the men's team in Mannheim, they had him in a defense-only role. Like, just play it simple, kid, play defense, whatever. Right. Then about half season, they started letting him do more offensively. Then his offense blossoms, and, you know, he wins the rookie of the year. So I, I think there's definitely enough offense there. You know, it's not like to the degree of Byram or anything, but I, I think people are going to be surprised again when they see it. Yeah, yeah. That, it's uh, going to be very interesting watching him, very intriguing to see if he can make the team this year. So uh, we, without going through every pick, I'm just trying to highlight a couple that, that caught my eye. Sure. So Edmonton picks Philip Broberg, certainly has all the physical talent, questions about the hockey IQ. What was your feeling about the Oilers desperately in need of a, a success story with their first pick this year taking him? Yeah, I thought there were, for me, there were better guys on the board. For me, there were better defensemen on the board, but... He, he's one of the younger guys in the draft, so he's got that going for him. He's always played up in age. He definitely has offense in his game. There is a question about the hockey IQ, no question about it, and maybe even decision-making, but he's young. So if somebody over there really trusts that those are things of just you know lack of maturity as a hockey player, then it'll turn out to be a really good pick. I, you know, I like Victor Soderstrom better, but, but that's me. They were... You know, when teams get a player, and in this draft they went a lot for need, they probably felt like he slotted in in a certain spot, and they needed that spot filled before they needed what, you know, Soderstrom could fill. I'm guessing that's what they were looking at, or even Cam York, you know, same as that. Right, right. And certainly Broberg are right there with Jack Hughes as two of the best skaters in the draft, so there's certainly that yeah. attribute, of course. Um, th the next player that caught my attention was a player, I think, had he not had a KHL commitment for two years, Vasily Pykolzin was taken by Vancouver, and if this player will come over and comply, this is a, a player that affects the, the, the game in all three zones, it's very mature, I really like this player, and I think he only fell because of his KHL commitment. What about you? No, that's true, and, and I wrote on uh, EP Ringside about month and a half ago, could Puck holes and fall, fall to the Flyers? Actually, no, I wrote that on Sportsology, sportsology.com, okay. my site. Um, I wrote, could Puck holes and fall to the Flyers? And, you know, I spoke to him at the Combine. They spoke to him. I think that was the Flyers' number one guy, and when that didn't happen, that's why they traded out. That's what I think. Uh, I'm, I'm not surprised because, again, it's a two-year deal. It could turn into a four-year commitment, you know. If he extends another two years, like someone like Kuznetsov did. Yeah. So, it wouldn't shock me. But, yeah, he's good in all three zones. He's tough. He can score. He's going to get better and better. But, you know, when will they get him? That's the question. And that's why some teams passed. Yeah. Yeah. That, it's, uh, that'll be another compelling uh, narrative there, seeing what happens. And then there's another pivot point in the draft, like you said, where Victor Soderstrom... Uh, picked by Arizona after a trade down from the Flyers. We'll get to the Flyers and Cam York and that and that pick. And there seems to be a big controversy at that point where, you know, Cole Caulfield is being kind of treated like Aaron Rodgers at, at, at the NFL draft where you, the camera flashes to the player every time mm -hmm. th they're not picked. And because you had Cole Caulfield ranked number six in your final 31 at sportsology.com. Yes. So this is the area that a lot of people thought he was going to get picked, and Soderstrom was a little bit of a surprise pick by Arizona. Yeah, no question. Uh, I like Soderstrom a lot. I mean, he was my third, second or third ranked defenseman. Uh, I, I really think Soderstrom, playing in the SHL, gained valuable experience. He's fast. He is um, 
unflappable. He's definitely got some offense in his game. I don't know if it's like elite offense, but it's definitely good. His skating's really, really good. He's physically fit. He thought the combine was easy. I've never heard anybody say the combine was easy. Right. So there's a lot there. So this is, you know, he wants to play with OEL. So that, that could, you know, could have played into it too. Maybe OEL gave him a scouting report. Who knows? But but that's a good thing. Uh, the Cole Caulfield part, yeah, I was surprised the Flyers passed on him at this point. I, I figured, hey, this worked out great for him. They, you know, they, they told Jason and I on Stick to Hockey, Fletcher did, that they were looking for uh, scoring, and if there was an elite scorer, they would take him. Didn't take him. So, you know, I just don't get it. I mean, he said goal scoring. I don't know if he said elite scoring, but either way. Right. That's your goal scoring. And he does more. I mean, so I think some people just are misunderstood about Cole Caulfield and what he can do. He doesn't just score. His defense started to come into play this year. He skates well. He can make passes at speed. There's a lot of things he can do. He's smart. He did 16 chin up, uh, pull ups, rather. So, yeah. And he's obviously pretty strong for his size. But again, size bias is still, still strong in the NHL, that's for sure. Yeah, Cole Caulfield is just a touch under. 5'8", 163, but if you're doing 16 pull-ups, uh, you're, you're not a weakling, that's for sure. No. So the, the inflection point, for, uh, I guess what I consider the final major inflection point of the draft was when Florida took Spencer Knight, and uh, it was unsure whether they would go that high, maybe trade down and try and get him, but sure enough, they got him, and they have a whole plan and goal. Uh, what's your feeling about uh, this particular player? I, I was a little surprised they went with him there, but I, I, I understand some people felt like that would happen. Uh, I do feel like they probably could have traded down and still got him, but maybe they knew more than I did and somebody else was going to take him. Yeah. You know, it's a good pick because he's a franchise guy. I think he's the number one franchise goalie. He's smart. He's ex- extremely strong. He's got a great glove hand. He doesn't have much of a five hole. He... Uh, protects the post real well, hugs the post real well, and he's really athletic. And so they can't miss on this pick. I think they, you know, it's a goalie. It's, you never know 100%, but I think they did a really good job with this. And with their lack of goaltending and aging goaltending, it will come into play, but, I, you know, I don't think it's going to come into play for at least three years. Yeah, well, of course, that's just enough time for Bob to step in there possibly, right? Maybe. Maybe, maybe. So... If uh, Dallas... Can I ask him a quick question while yeah sure yeah. while he's talking about that? I, I got a I, I got a thing uh, on our last show. We talked about how how crazy it was, how great uh, the United States hockey has been, and how much they put so much uh, effort into their development program. Is it was this a surprise to anybody that they had so many of their their prospects finish in the top fifteen? No, because they were all ranked. So to see 17 go this time wasn't a surprise. It may have been a surprise five years ago, but this time now they, they were all ranked. And so not a surprise, probably just a matter of where were they going to go. So no, I mean, this, this was just, it was pretty much expected and they lived up to the expectation. Cool. Yeah. And, and I think we look back, Russ, if Dallas's pick doesn't work out, they can always claim they were looking for. They wanted Harley Thomas, not Thomas Harley. That's something I'll remember. <laughs> I missed all that. I was. Um, I don't know what I was doing? I was waiting on somebody, so I didn't get to hear or see that. <laughs> yeah, that that was a good one. So uh, Peyton Krebs drops to 17 at Vegas. Uh, is that a? He was something. He was somebody, I should say. That according to Anthony Sanfilippo, who had caught the early attention of the Flyers, and then he has a partial tear of the Achilles tendon. Uh, he's uh, just a smidge below six feet, very fit, really a bad team he played for, for, but super competitive. And I would think he would catch the eye of many teams had it not been for that injury. Yeah, no question. I think he fell like four or five spots, maybe a few more because of it. He he was he is smart and fast and you know, you you hope that this Achilles wouldn't affect him in the same way that maybe the first Achilles surgery for Carlson didn't affect him. Right. Well, at least it was a partial tear. He didn't sever it. So th- there's a good news uh, scenario there. 
Was you think that Matthew Boldy was one of those guys they were hoping would fall when they made the original trade down? No, because they could have drafted him without the trade. You know. Right, right. So they had their group of when they made the trade down, they probably had a, a few guys in mind, and they figured they'd be happy uh, with the, any of those guys. I would imagine. Yeah, because otherwise they could have just selected Caulfield. They could have just selected Boldy. Right, right, exactly. And I guess the last compelling story, of course, was if uh, Caulfield was Aaron Rodgers, then maybe Arthur Kaliev was Brady Quinn, again, with the green room treatment by the networks when he wasn't drafted, and he goes to the L.A. Kings early in the second round. I'm sorry, which player broke up a little? I'm sorry, Arthur Kaliev. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's. I, I'm not shocked he went out of the first. I kept him lately ranked in mine at 23rd, so that you know, that does cover you through the second in that in that circumstance when you rank somebody right around that spot. He he's definitely a goal scorer. He's definitely got physical play, but he definitely needs to work on his skating and and probably his 60 minute engine. And so those those reasons were enough to drop him because. If you are just a goal scorer, you got to do more in today's NHL. And he's going to have to play some sort of defense and, again, get faster. So, you know, not that it becomes a project at that point, but just a little bit more of one. He's lucky he's going to the organization he is because, hey, the Kings are really good at developing. So they'll do the right things with him and be very patient. Yeah, they, and they have a dearth of talent there, so they, they don't have much choice yeah, with what yeah, happened yeah. with unfortunately with Gabe Velarde and the spinal issues that he's had uh, uh, up to this time. Yeah, but that's why they went with a center, and that's why I knew they would go with a center because um, Velarde, we just don't know what it'll be now. Yeah, yeah. So we can keep our fingers crossed for him because he really is a dominating player uh, when he's got it all together. But uh, last I heard, he's oh, yeah. a, a slow comeback, and uh, we can hope for the best there. Yeah, I mean, again, I, when I heard about him just before the draft, it was definitely more severe than even I had imagined. Yeah, yeah, he had a, I don't know if he had a congenital problem or what, what the situation was. But Not sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, again, all the best uh, for Gabe Velarde's uh, recovery for, uh, for the Kings and for the player, more importantly. But, uh, Russ, let's... Uh, Let's drill down on, on what the Flyers did. I, I thought they had a very professionally run draft, and uh, they mm -hmm. trade down, as we talked about earlier, from 11 to 14. They picked the 13th uh, ranked player on your board, uh, Cam York. Uh, tell us about this uh, defenseman. Yeah, he, he's a guy that a lot of people pick out as skating and offense first, but really a great puck, puck retriever and, and good defender, really good defender. So fast, smart, smooth, a lot of poise. You saw that in, in camp today. If You saw some of them. Uh, great shot. Could definitely set up things. Power play. He could play top power play. I don't know if he's a number one in the NHL. We'll see. I mean, that's, you know, we'll see about that one. He definitely needs to get stronger. He's, he's pretty thin right now, but he definitely will get stronger. Uh, a lot of former, former players and players that play against him love his brain. And just his decision making, and and just the way he moves up the ice, pretty effortlessly. So, a really good pick. You know, like I said, my issue is, is that pick in a forty-five better than a guy who maybe could lead your team in goal scoring? Like that's what you have to decide. I felt like they had a lot of prospects, so I don't know if I needed two for one there. They both might be really good players. Maybe even both you know, all-star caliber, but this other one may be even better than that. So that's, you know, that's where I say, mm, I don't know if that was necessary or not, but it's still a good draft pick because he's a really good player. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, there's, there's value there. It's not like they went and, and took somebody uh, kind of lower, like a Ryan Johnson, who's a fine player. It could be a fine player, but the, right. the, the draft was kind of separated after the first 15 or 16 picks or so it seemed. Yeah. So at least when the Flyers did get a chance to move up in the second round, which the, they went up from, I think, 45 to uh, mm -hmm. 34 or, or 40, yeah, 45. They traded with Nashville. 
and they get Bobby Brink, who's rated number 16. And I guess it's inevitable there's going to be a comparison between uh, Cole Caulfield, who's a better player right now, and Bobby Brink, because they're both scorers, but they're different. How, how can fans look at the two and say, and, and you know, maintain a distinction? Okay, so, well, Brink is really good on his edges. He definitely needs to work on his stride, and, and that's something where that could definitely be fixed because I think it's just a strength issue, like a leg strength issue. He's still a little lanky, so that's fine. He definitely is a goal scorer first. He definitely uh, can make some good passes and good sc- to set up his uh, teammates too. He does need to work on his defense, no question. He, uh, he can be a pit of a pain to, to play against. I've seen him do really good things in a tournament play, so I really like him. I don't know if he's going to be more than a 25-goal guy a year. That's what um, he'll have to prove to me. But he does have a really good shot, and, and he does have a will to score. So they moved up, and at least they did get a goal scorer. They just didn't get the best one, I thought. Right, right. And this guy thinks the game real well. It just doesn't yeah. have quite the physical package that Caulfield does, it, it seems. Yeah, it's just it's it's not so much even that. It's really just the the shot and the release and the uh, goal scoring acumen that Caulfield has. Like Caulfield goes to this thing called the shooting room at the NTDP and and practices forever. And players go there all the time. And I kidded Cam York about it. He does, you know, he said he does, does go there, but everybody just marvels at Caulfield there, including Jack Hughes, because that is his thing. You know, it's almost like a Bossy Trottier thing. Like you know, Tr- Trottier was the all around guy. And, and Bossy was the goal-scoring guy. Uh, you don't have to tell me, Russ. Uh, and nobody killed the Flyers more than Mike Bossy. Listen, I grew up a Ranger fan, and I lived on Long Island. I would read about him in the paper every day, so I can't, can't help you here. He was. He, <laughs> I tell you what, I mean, it was such a shame with his back and everything. Yeah. One of the greatest pure scorers in the history of the game, no question. Yeah, no question. No question. So uh, uh, the, the Flyers' third pick... Made your top 31. His name is Ronnie Adderd. He's an overage yep. defenseman. Big strapping young man. Big shot. Fast. Maybe not the best puck skills. And with overagers, you got to be careful about being uh, irrationally exuberant. Yeah. I, I don't know about that. I, I, I really hesitate with all this extra watch, watching or ex don't be too excited, or he's an overager, so let's not overrate his his numbers. His numbers are his numbers. He still had to get them in a league. He still had to play against players. Mm-hmm. So he's older, fine. But also sometimes guys are just put it all together late. That seems to be the case here. That's why I put him where I put him, because he has a booming shot. He's smart. He is very mobile. His skating will get better. I don't know how much better, but it's already pretty good. He definitely can get up the ice. He can hammer home those shots. He can hammer you in the mouth. Uh, I know a scout from a team that, you know, played against his, Adder's team and lost. And, you know, him and um, Zach Taylor from the Rangers were a pairing, and they were deadly. And they said Adder just killed him, like just totally killed him. Right. So that could be a, a little bit of a diamond in the rough uh, at, at the third oh. round. And... Yeah, and it might take a little while, and that's fine, you know. Yeah, they're in no hurry with a guy like this. They they certainly have enough guys at his level, like Igor Zamula, uh, Wyatt Kalinick, and, and and others uh, of that ilk. So yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 we can't forget Adam Yinning, a defensive specialist who could be here in a couple of years. So yeah, that they're, they're in good yeah, shape. He's good. I saw him today. He definitely looks bigger. Good, good. Um, just a, an aside with Yinning, uh, what, what are his puck skills like? Was that that was a question I had with about him? Actually, they're pretty good. I mean, he he skates pretty well. He um, he makes a great first first pass. He's smart. He's strong. Very confident. Good, good. So I have to ask you this, Russ Mason Millman. Would you say that he took four rounds to hitchhike to Saginaw? I really don't know much about Millman. I hadn't seen much about of him this year. So that pick, can't tell you much about. Uh, <laughs> they may have done a good job with that pick, but that one I really can't comment on much. Yeah, they, they, he had a good second half. That was my Prague rock, uh, rock reference. 
instead of uh, sorry. four rounds to hitchhike from Saginaw from America. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, it was. It, I was. I, I didn't give you enough notice on that one. So, no, you did say you were going to make a prog rock reference at some point, and I wasn't ready for it. My no, bad. it's okay. It's okay. We've been whipping through these prospects. Uh, we have somebody. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, as uh, Sir Juck. I was hoping his name was Sir Duke because he would have an automatic theme song if he made it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> that would yeah, be, be a great theme know, song. You, it could be. Once you get fourth round on, it get, gets chancier. It does. Even Ross I saw a little bit of today. You know, I saw there's a little something there. You know, pretty good glove and such. You know, we'll see. I mean, again, young boy, 18 has only played one year for the Thunderbirds. Not a lot for me to go on. Haven't seen him. Thunderbirds, I didn't get to see really anything of this year. Right. So, you know, it could be good. We'll see. Yeah. No. You were you were at uh, the opening day of development camp. Uh, it, what jumped out at yes. you? you? You noticed things like the inning look bigger, and uh, what other players may made an impression upon you from year to year, like an improvement or, or a skill set that jumped out at you. Well, Frost is now like 185 pounds, so I felt like there's even a little bit more um, snap on his shot. His skating's great. His accuracy's great. I felt like he's the best goal scorer there. So so that jumped out at me. I, I really liked what I saw out of Farabee. His passing is really good, really sharp. We know he could score some goals, but his passing's great. And so that's something where I feel like he's, he's a really good dual threat. And he's put on a little bit of muscle, too. He's smart. Look, both those guys know that there's a chance for a winger spot, but I would rather see those guys start out in the A. I don't care how good they look out of the gate. Right. I could think back to, you know, Minnesota where, you know, they probably started out Luke Cunning a little too young, too, out of need. And I felt like his progress has slowed a little bit now that he's 21. you got to be careful with that. Now, he's a center. I get it. But you have to be careful about that. So you... you you really, if you make the wrong decision on that, you could definitely set a guy back, sometimes forever, or just sometimes they never get to the to the path you thought they would because you made them sort of change their game right then and there. So, you know, that's, you know, Lucas Bees was a guy that that happened to, as an yes, example. In absolutely. And you know what? They take shortcuts to just hang on in the league because they don't want to go, they don't want to feel like well, they're regressing, and that's not the right attitude to have. Right. And so that's why, you know, both guys know, hey, we might not make it, but both those guys are, are the two best in camp. I like what I see out of Radcliffe, too, don't get me wrong. And right. he's a real leader, and everything that happened in Guelph um, really made him better mentally and on and off the ice. It's definitely made him grow. So, but again, he's a big guy. He's less lanky than he used to be. But I still, as a, with big guys, I want to be be cautious because those those power forwards and he is one um yeah you can't rush those guys at all no you talk about the, the uh, hockey uh, jargon on that is linkage in terms yeah. of the 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 bigger body let let's get them let let them establish that linkage so everything is coordinated and uh you know they grow into their body and uh they don't have to take a step back yeah it's like nick ritchie they they waited a while for him in um, Anaheim, and it was worth the wait. Like, he's he's been a really good player. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, you know, an outside chance for that, if there's a kid that's going to step up, who, and I'm thinking if he can stay healthy and show during the exhibition and in camp, I'm thinking maybe Giramon Rupsov. Has he seen enough pro time that if he flashes that it could be the real thing, or does he still need more time? I still think he needs more time because injury robbed some of his, some games, and I do feel like players need to play a certain amount of games. He's really cool. he's definitely come in looking stronger. Uh, he had one of the more powerful shots for sure. Scott Gordon still talks him up. So I just think it's one of those things where even if it's just 30 games at the AHL level, let's just make sure. Get through those 30, don't get hurt, and we'll talk. Gotcha. No, that, that he's the guy who's kind of like my dark horse to to emerge, yeah. uh, kind of like mid-season. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a, a plausible scenario. Uh, it is. Yeah, let's, uh, Russ. We've been talking before you got on, and I think. Help me. Uh, Why? Yeah, we yeah we can't help it. We just <laughs> we just we, we we follow you on uh you know off the post, and we follow you on hockeybuzz.com, and like we just wish you were on more outlets. No, but um. <laughs> <laughs> You're everywhere. You're Mr. Ubiquitous. But, no, what the Flyers have done, you know, Mr. – I call him the prodigal GM, uh, Chuck Fletcher. For someone who's this methodical, it seems like he's expended a lot of capital when they're, still, when they're trying to capture the prime of what's left of Giroux and Voracek, and everything seems to be predicated on that. But if you look at how they're positioned – and I just wonder, like, is this really what what he had in mind? Well, I think what you what you have in mind and what you're able to execute are always two different things. Right. And I heard Yarmo Kekalainen say it was hard to make some deals. So, you know, things that he's had to do, he's had to overpay for. Overpay a little bit for Kevin Hayes. Definitely overpay for for Braun and, and Niskanen. You know, Niskanen ate 30% of Gudis's contract, which yeah. wasn't that much. So then that makes Niskanen over a $7 million defenseman, which he's clearly not anymore, right? So you look at those things and you say, all right, I mean, that's how they sort of have kept the vision going. You know, they they basically just dumped Hartman to save a little bit more money. Uh, They just, you know, there's some moves that have been made that wouldn't be made if they didn't have cap issues. And they, they don't have them yet, but they're coming. Yep. So... Oh, Ivan Provorov's probably going to get seven and a half or eight a year, perhaps, and and if that's on an eight-year deal, you know, so that's that's a bit more. I think Connecty's going to get around four. You know, they went cheap on Sandheim because they bridged him, but you know, after the bridge is up, if he's Travis Sandheim or better, you know, <laughs> then they're going to have another tough decision to make. So mm-hmm. that one they just sidestep for now, so they can sort of fit in the cap the way they see it. It's getting tough though. It's going to, you know. Cap didn't go up a ton. You know, maybe they'll have five million bucks left in cap space when the season starts after the summer cap is done. Uh, wouldn't shock me if it's not that much more than that. Yeah, no, I, I it seems like uh, three million dollars between the cap not going higher, the uh, the the hold back on uh, what's his name uh, on Braun, I'm, I'm missing it, right? And um, then of course the uh, extra money that. Uh, Hayes got because they, you know, they kind of locked themselves in. It was like down the memory hole. That that money is gone. Right. How important this year, and, I, and it's something we emphasized before you came on, is that backup goalie position. I keep reading Chuck Fletcher and getting the the feeling he's really concerned about putting a lot on Carter Hart. But has he backed himself into a corner where he's going to have to go cheaper than he actually wanted to originally? I guess it's possible, depending on where in the process the goalie gets signed, uh, or let, or that means that Scott Lawton will have to accept less. You know, like that's it, it may come down to that. He's probably going to be the last guy that gets his deal. I mean, Fletcher, you know, a month ago told us it was going to be like a 50 32 game split. Right. You know, 50 something, 30 something. So, and he said he didn't know which way it would go, whether it would be Hart with the 50 or somebody else with the 50. So he, he was leaving the door open for, you know, potential second year slump or moments where he hits the wall and needs a break. That is possible. Like it's a, this is, you know, this whole hope in the next two years, because you think you see a spot open in the division all depends on Carter Hart and or the backup they get. So Talbot now thinks he's probably can get a starting job or more playing time somewhere else. So he's not signed yet. Right. Uh, I've heard Elliot, could be the guy that comes back. We'll see. I mean, you know, someone like Robin Leonard certainly is not going to come, and he wants five years anyhow, so maybe he settles for four. So, yeah, this is going to be a, an interesting one. Someone like Varlamov probably wouldn't come. You know, it's I don't know who they're going to be able to get. And so that will be the definitely a key thing. I thought that with two years left on his deal, and some tough decisions ahead for that club, the Flyers might be interested in Jake Allen. With who that broke up? Uh, with Jake Allen. Jake Allen. Uh, I guess it's a possibility. Allen did bounce back this year. 
as a backup, but St. Louis would have to eat money. I don't think they'd be willing to eat like two million a year. No. I don't think they'd do that. No, just like what we talked about, it just depends on how important that uh, Chuck Fletcher thinks that position is. So uh, I guess if, from there, the Flyers are going to have to get rid of one defenseman. I would imagine it's not going to be Gus Despair now. Uh, it looks more like Haig, but uh, as we head into yeah. the UFA period, it, it's hard to say uh, what they're going to do. And mm -hmm. um, it's not a really great class as it is. No, and, and I think it might be Haig. And, and then they're going to have to probably try and sneak – Moran back to the minors because, you know, he didn't play last year and he's not going to make the team. Hmm. Well, I mean, yeah. Unless... Think he's... No Dan... <laughs> Dan just had a collective sigh. Yeah, Dan, is, is the, uh, Dan the, the Flyer fan, is the biggest Sam Moran fan in the world, so you kind of... Well, Dan, just tell me where you think he's going to slot in. Well, that's the issue I have as well. You know, it obviously depends what they think of Robert Haig being the seventh, but uh, I don't think he has a, a top six spot. But, you know, I do have Phantom season tickets this year, so I would not uh, hate seeing him in the minors. Okay. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And there's, there's always, always, there's always Schlemko, wherever Schlemko fits in. Listen, Schlemko, you know, that's that's the one where I think there's a little trickery here because I really think he's an AHLer at this point. I hear, oh, well, you know, you could always bring up Schlemko. I don't think they're going to do it unless they're desperate. Uh, I watched games. He looked fine in the AHL. I don't know if he's going to do, be able to do anything in the NHL. And that's more, you know, just hidden money. Yeah, yeah. That, that, they don't need every cent they can get. But last thing, Russ, before we let you go, is, and, and I think I know the answer, but I'll ask you anyway. Are there going to be any offer sheets this year? for these RFA, the best RFA class in recent memory? All right, I'm trying to think. Um, all right, so let's do a mathematical equation. What's zero divided by zero? Um, <laughs> zero. There you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's kind of where I'm at, too. But... Uh, Hey, Russ, it's so great to have you on. I'm glad we could have you on all night. you got better things to do. But hey, if, if people want to follow uh, Russ Cohen, or if, if, if there's anything you want. It's Philly's game. I don't know if I have better things to do or not. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, well, you got a point there. <laughs> but uh, we can follow you at on Twitter at sportsology.com. Is there anything you're promoting right now People, you want people to know about? Nah, just go to sportsology.com or at sportsology on at Twitter or or don't. It's fine. Okay, and they can find you on <laughs> hockeybuzz.com uh, usually Monday through Friday, and of course off the post. Uh, yep. How how long? How many more shows are you going to do off the post with Anthony Min and Joni and uh, Michael Algello? Probably two. Um, we'll probably go longer with um, with uh, stick to hockey. I don't know how much longer, but we'll probably go longer with that. I think we're going to tape another one tomorrow, actually. Uh, and then I know on Sirius I have probably two more spots left. I usually go Wednesdays and Fridays, so this week might be the last week for Sirius on that. And then, you know, there'll be sporadic things in the summer. Something will happen. We'll just do a show out of nowhere. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, I really appreciate you coming on, and uh, you're welcome on any time. Hey, thanks. I appreciate it. You guys are always great. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Have a good night. All right. Take care now. Okay. So, uh, gents, uh, you heard the man. Um, uh, Dan, let, let me get your thoughts. I know you, you're, you're still recovering a little bit from the uh, Sam Moran shock. Um, he broke my heart. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> Dan he needs a hug. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of forgot. I'll, I'll say this. Uh, I'll stick up for Dan a little bit here. I do. I do think that they're going to keep Sam over Haig, though. I think that Haig gets moved. I think I he's would hope so. the guy. What's that? I would hope so. Yeah, I mean, uh, pretty much. We you, you've seen everything you've seen out of out of Haig. That's all he is. That's all he's ever going to be. He, he he can move at least. You know. You, you you have that covered it and Sam is is signed for what three more years two more I believe two more three two more two or three more years three more I think. At, at, at a pretty cheap price 
So I'm saying that Too that's much. the kind of route you're going to go if you're going to keep one of them. I would go with just somebody who has the higher ceiling. Two more at uh, seven hundred thousand a year. Okay, yeah. there you go. There you but go. Uh, you know, I, I I just I don't know how. What, what do you do with the guy? I think if you put him on waivers, somebody's going to pick him up. Former yeah. first round pick. He's six seven, a good penalty killer. You know, unless you roll with you know eight defensemen on the roster this year and just. Hope that somebody – well, not, I don't hope that somebody gets hurt, but, you know, uh, uh, have the flexibility if need be. And I think that – you know, I, that's the positive with, with Braun and Niskanen is you're not limited to just the same six guys. that You, you do have an opportunity to kind of switch, them, uh, switch things up yeah. a little bit. But uh, overall, you know, you at the same time, you brought in so many bodies that you don't really have a spot for everybody now. Well, the biggest issue is only got eight NHL games. So uh, there are teams that might want to take – a flyer on him, no no pun intended, but uh, it would be a leap of faith to have a guy that green. But you find me a better player in the history of the NHL who played eight games. Can't do it. That that, that is true. Uh, that's the, yeah yeah. You know what? That that is absolutely <laughs> case closed. There, no, I, yeah. I can't argue with that. So uh, I think the only other thing that, that we're getting ready for the free agency period, and I, I think the only thing the Flyers can look at assuming they do make a trade and move out somebody like Robert Haig is useful depth players, you know, guys like Marcus Kruger or, uh, I don't know, Oscar Lindbaugh, uh, Lindbergh, I should say, Oscar Lindbergh, uh, Tyler Ennis. Uh, these are not great names, but, you know, unless you think a kid is going to grab one of those spots, these are guys that grade out pretty well. Uh, whether you're just watching them or, or analytically, I don't think they don't ha- they don't have the cash for Matt Zuccarello or Nyquist or yeah. anybody like that. So it would be more like um, yeah. Another one is Eunice Donskoy, and he could make about three million dollars a year. He's 27. Analytics are great. I've seen a guy. I always notice him. He's an excellent two-way player. He can score a little bit. Uh, he would be my number one choice. And he could be a good third line player, but I just don't know if the Flyers are going to have the cash. Yeah, I think that's what uh, a lot of this, well, the rest of the summer is going to come down to is how much, you know, how how tight can they penny pinch through the rest of the off season here? You know, obviously it depends on what Provorov ends up making and what Konechny ends up making, but uh, yeah, it's going to be a going to be a tight year. I don't expect a whole lot of action from the Flyers, especially signing for agents uh, once the period opens. Maybe another trade or two, but uh, I don't know where they're going to find money from to uh, really bring anybody valuable in. Yeah, uh, and Chef, one other name would be Brett Connolly, ex of the, uh, I guess the Capitals because I don't know if they're going to have enough uh, cash to, to pay him. That remains to be seen. I mean, they put a lot of money into Carl Hagelin after the Flyers did them the favor of holding back that million dollars for for uh, uh, Gudis' salary in the Niskanen trade, which, you know, again, the underlying theme there, both San Jose and Washington are cap-strapped, and and it, it's like yeah, Chuck got out his kneecaps, uh, his knee pads, and I don't I don't know. I just, He's got to break some kneecaps, you mean. Yeah, to get yeah. I think there was a Freudian slip there. But <laughs> there is one uh, guy that we were talking about before Russ got on who is a newly uh, a UFA, he doesn't know about it, who could be a third liner. His name is Ryan Hartman, but I, I don't think – I think he's uh, he's worn out his welcome here. I think when he finds out what happens, I, I think, you know, he doesn't want to be here. Nah, nah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, well, you know, right now, uh, as we wrap things up, we've really had a, a great time tonight. We hope you have enjoyed listening to us and, and Russ coming on and really giving you probably the best analysis of the draft and the Flyers draft in particular you're going to find anywhere. But, um, you know, the, the Flyers are having their, uh, their camp right now, development camp. They're going to have a trial on the aisle, and they're going to hit the beach Notice I said H I T <laughs> hit the beach, and they're going to they're going to be back over the weekend and have some uh, three on three and five on five uh, action there to uh, suss out who is where. So that's where they're at right now. And then free agency starts July first, and we'll be back in a couple weeks and see what the Flyers do. I think by July fifteenth, the team that you see by that point will be pretty much 
what the Flyers will go into camp with, and then further decisions will be made. With that, uh, Chef, uh, any final thoughts? No, I think there's one or two trades left in him. I think he moves around a little bit. Hopefully it's for a backup goalie. And that, that's all I can say is I, I, I want somebody other than, you know, even Russ kind of alluded to it that, God, we might get stuck again. Like he's the only thing out there that's available to us. So uh, with, I'm sorry, with Elliot is what I'm alluding yeah. to. Yeah. Uh, and I just think that I, I would, I would float, I would float a player out there. I would float somebody like Ghost if I could get a really solid backup def- uh, uh, goalie. So, and if I, I, I don't want to do it, but I will do it just because I don't want to, I, I, right now, I don't want to impede Carter Hart's growth and development as opposed to Ghost. Ghost is pretty much where he's at. And if he doesn't bounce back this year, we know what kind of player he is. Well, that's a, that, that's a tough choice. I really do believe that the back of goaltender is super important this year. Hey, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he'll come out. He'll, uh, Carter Hart will come out 55 games. It'll be like a, a 919 to 922 save percentage, and everything will be copacetic. And uh, an Elliott level guy is enough. But you get a 34 year old guy with hip, uh, groin, and abdomen yeah. issues. That's that's a loser. That's that's like like Hextall heading into the year. That you're just asking for trouble. Uh, Dan, uh, your final thoughts. Yeah, uh, you know Fletcher has kind of been pulling trades out left and right without any kind of rumors or anything. So I don't know if he's quite finished yet. But uh, you know, been a wild ride so far. I think the Flyers will be better. But overall, I'm still kind of skeptical of the long term plan here. But uh, you know, it is what it is. And Sam Moran is the greatest defenseman of all time. Yeah, no, I'm glad you got that in because that's that's probably the thing they waited an hour and fifteen minutes to hear. I would uh, hope so. <laughs> was that proclamation, <laughs> and uh, Dan will be fulminating uh, about that on his other uh, podcasts. And um, <laughs> yeah, with that, just a reminder that the OMB podcast is on so many formats I can't even remember them. Uh, we're on iHeartRadio now, along of course with iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Spotify. The o b Podcast YouTube channel. If you could rate and subscribe the sh- uh, to the show, we'd really appreciate that. And, uh, 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 Dan, before I go, let, let's uh, get people to find out where they can contact you and follow uh, your goings-on. Well, you can find me at Dan the Flyer Fan on Twitter. You can find the site at Brotherly Puck. The uh, weekly summer series are back at Top 5 every Monday. History of Flyers jersey numbers every Wednesday. And the abbreviated History of Series, which will be biographies of all your favorite Flyers, every Friday from then on. Uh, you can find my podcast at Brotherly underscore pod. We've done four. This is my fifth straight day of show and i've done eight shows in the past 10 days so there's plenty of content up there for you to listen we'll be back next week to cover all of the free agency stuff as well you can find the other sites at national puck and at national pod net fantastic fantastic and uh listen we'll be back with you i think around the 9th of july let's let's get you know things to settle in you can follow us on twitter at omb puck i can be followed at isaiah I-S-A-I-A-H underscore 520. Don't forget the underscore at Isaiah underscore 520. And Chef, uh, where can people find you? At Chef LFB on Twitter. And you can come in and see me at Steam Pub in Southampton, PA, 606 Second Street Pike. You ask for me, I'll give you a discount. That's how it works. Maybe you have a free app. Oh, you got it. Fantastic. And with that, everybody, hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be back in a couple weeks. Until next time, take care.